So we've got over 100 participants now, so I'm going to uh, start things off. Welcome, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good day, good evening, uh, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is uh, Ross Upshur. I'm a professor in the Dalai School of uh, Public Health at the University of Toronto. Um, and I'm also the Associate Director of the Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute at Sinai Health in Toronto. And it's my absolute great delight to uh, be the moderator and chair today uh, for this really, I think, timely and important uh, uh, webinar on ethical priorities for a new international instrument on pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. And we're exceptionally fortunate to have uh, uh, several uh, speakers of immensely high quality. So just a bit of context, uh, in December 2021, the World Health Assembly agreed to establish an intergovernmental negotiating body to develop a, a WHO instrument to strengthen pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. And it's currently under development, and now it's time for, uh, you know, I think it's a great time to start to think about how ethics will inform or interact with this pandemic treaty. So this webinar is going to explore the ways in which such a treaty uh, could ensure that the intrinsically ethical values and judgments which inform decisions in pandemic uh, 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 response uh, and planning uh, should be addressed at uh, multiple levels, multinational, national, and, at, uh, uh, and which organizations are involved as well. Um, so I'm going to introduce the speakers and uh, then have a little bit of uh, uh, housekeeping about how this uh, um, webinar is going to uh, uh, go uh, um, operate today. So our first speaker will be uh, Dr. Alex Phelan, and she's a globally recognized expert on public health and international law. She works on law and governance of infectious diseases and the impact of global change events on health, such as climate change and biodiversity. Uh, Dr. Phelan advises international organizations and governments around the world in both public health and legal responses to outbreaks and pandemics. She also works on the negotiation of new legal instruments such as the proposed uh, pandemic treaty and reform of the international health regulations and Nagoya Protocol. Uh, Dr. Phelan is an assistant professor at the Center for Global Health Science and Security, uh, the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Georgetown University Medical Center, and adjunct uh, professor at Georgetown uh, University Law Center. Next, uh, we will have uh, Professor uh, Calvin Ho. Oh, hold on a sec. So Dr. Calvin Ho is associate professor with the Faculty of Law and co-director of the Center for Medical Ethics at the University of Hong Kong. His research is primarily on the governance of health and biomedical technologies, including human genome editing, uh, human pluripotent stem cell research, and health technologies based on artificial intelligence and data analytics. He's an ethics board member for the uh, Médecins Sans Frontières Ethics Review Board and a member of the COVID-19 Ethics and Governance Working Group of the World Health Organization. And last but by no means least is Dr. Moga Kamalyani. Uh, she's a senior health advisor with over 40 years of experience in health policy and programming with international and national health and development agencies, including multilateral agencies, NGOs, and governments. In addition, she has in-depth experience and knowledge of policy and advocacy on access to medicines and on financing and delivery of healthcare. Currently, Dr. Kamalyani is serving as a Senior Policy and Technical Advisor to the UNAIDS and People Vaccine Alliance on Access to COVID-19 Health Technologies, and is a key advisor to the NGO board members of UN, of UN UNAID. Uh, she has been deeply engaged with most uh, international health organizations, including the WHO, the Global Fund, UNAID, uh, Medicines uh, Patent Pool, and the World Bank. Uh, she has in-depth experience in conducting programs, advocacy and research in several countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, Eastern Europe, and the Middle East. So as you can see, we've brought the right uh, uh, alchemy of speakers and experience and expertise to bring to bear uh, on this topic. So just for the, uh, uh, the process, uh, each speaker is going to speak for about five to 10 minutes in the order that I've already set out. Uh, we'll have a little bit of interchange uh, between them, uh, follow up and comments. And then we have a series of questions uh, that we've also been, uh, uh, that have been, some have been pre-sent, but uh, some have also been solicited from uh, potential uh, members of the webinar. We're gonna ask, uh, you know, we like to see the chat function being used as a, uh, uh, you know, a way of everybody to introduce themselves uh, 
But uh, given the uh, webinar uh, uh, this and the importance of this, so of course it goes without saying that the webinar is being uh, recorded. It's going to be shared on the Epidemic Ethics website and the Global Health Network website and the Global Health Network YouTube and Facebook page. So stay tuned for that. But uh, we'd also like uh, to engage the chat box in a little bit more uh, dynamic way for substantive comments and feedback on the subsequent on the seminar topic and any issues that uh, arise during the subsequent dis dis uh, discussion. And if you would like your comments and feedback attributed when fed back to the WHO, you can either post your full name and attribution within, with the comment where it will be seen by all attendees at this seminar, or you can send the comment name and attribution to uh, epidemic ethics at the global health network.org if you prefer that. And this has also been posted in the uh, um, uh, in the chat. So due to the number of participants, your camera and microphone are disabled. So uh, please use the chat function for any technical issues. Now with that all behind us, I'm really delighted to uh, turn the uh, floor over, the virtual floor, I guess, uh, to Alex to uh, kick us off on this really important discussion. Alex, over to you. Thank you so much, Ross. Um, so this morning uh, and this afternoon, this evening, I'll be speaking about how the pandemic treaty is an opportunity to use law to embed ethics in an international instrument. Um, and so I'll be coming at this very much from the uh, international law angle um, and look forward to uh, exploring this further in the discussion. So the pandemic treaty has, uh, has been described as having two overarching goals, um, preventing and responding to pandemics. But we can actually break this down even further that will help reveal some key ethical issues that the treaty will need to address. Um, and even this process itself involves um, weighing ethical questions. So with uh, the goal of prevention, part of this is because we know that spillovers, when spillovers occur, they have the potential to become, pan become outbreaks. And so the goal of reducing that spillover risk to reduce the potential risk of outbreaks. But outbreaks then can become pandemics. And so when we're looking at preventing pandemics, we're also talking about not just preventing spillovers, but then preventing outbreaks that do occur from coming, becoming pandemics. And that's a very separate question. But pandemics themselves, when they do occur, create catastrophic impacts. And so we want to reduce those pandemic impacts as a part of response. Um, the challenge there is that the, the actual pandemic impacts themselves have a positive feedback loop and they can reduce resiliency that mean that um, we actually don't recover or have resilient health systems or other socioeconomic structures in our society that can themselves then increase the sociological drivers of spillovers. So rather than this being a twofold prevent and respond or even a linear process, this is actually a cycle. And, and in our research, we describe this as, a, as the pandemic cycle. It's been described by Ed Young at the Atlantic as the pandemic scene, um, that what we are doing today, whether it be because of climate change, whether it be because of exhausted health systems, actually put us at greater risk for pandemics going forward. And so if we map this in a circular way rather than a linear way, what we can start to see is that we have um, four quadrants, so to speak, over which we need to reduce this risk. Um, and one of, the, one of the challenges that we've already seen come out during the pandemic treaty is that there's been significant focus on just in particular one of these quadrants, in particular reducing spillover risk. There's been some attention to reducing pandemic risk um, and very limited attention to recovery and resilience. But it's important that if we're going to create a safe operating space for global health, we need to be reducing risks in all four of these quadrants. And right now, as mentioned, with this focus on what does one of these quadrants in particular and how we weight our focus on these quadrants, um, particularly uh, divided between high income countries priorities and more global priorities or priorities from LMICs, um, we're making ethical considerations in the way we're weighting the, the elements of the pandemic treaty itself. So if we break this out into how might a pandemic treaty start to balance this across the elements that a pandemic treaty could contain, we've developed this, uh, this structure, these 12 elements across four quadrants that seek to bring equitable consideration into the pandemic treaty process. 
So, you know, let's take one example. Despite the lessons of COVID-19, many high income countries, as mentioned, continue to focus on spillover risk. So looking at, say, zoonotic risk assessment or One Health solutions or even surveillance and assessment. And part of the challenge with that is not only does that there is a practical limit to that, um, it assumes that we can stop all spillover events, which in the Anthropocene, with the scale of spillover events that occur, we cannot. It's also a high technology silver bullet approach that seems to think that upstream is the way to go. But, uh, but secondly, when an outbreak does occur, um, even um, high income countries, have, have, as have been demonstrated in COVID-19, that assumed and through multiple assessments made assumptions about their healthcare systems, did not have strong health system, healthcare systems that were able to cope. So not only is there that practical reality and faulty assumptions, but there's also an ethical, uh, ethical uh, balancing that occurs when we strengthen healthcare systems with a lot uh, in a lot more economically um, efficient manner than say focusing on high costs you know, like risk assessment that's not going to capture all of the upstream risks when we strengthen healthcare systems around the world we also have a series of health co-benefits uh, whether that's talking about maternal and child care whether that's the impacts from air pollution whether it be ncds and so when we're balancing where our money our legal provisions and the the pandemic treaty itself is going we're making a range of questions we're making a range of ethical judgments that at the moment is not adequately balanced so that's what this kind of structure these 12 elements seek to do now some of these elements are more likely in the text of the treaty to be captured by things like guiding principles or a preambular language um, maybe in interpretive provisions of the treaty and I think that's a really important place for, for ethics to play an imp important role is how the treaty should be interpreted and what guidelines and principles should be used for interpreting the treaty and we've seen part of that in the draft already to some degree but not so much on ethical principles. Um, other um, elements are actually going to form key core provisions of the treaty that involve really live uh, ethical questions that I know the other speakers are going to be speaking about in, in more detail. Um, so, for example, a key priority, number seven, equitable access to global goods. Um, these uh, elements are also tied together. So there, are, there is significant push, for example, from high income countries to open up uh, the sharing of pathogen samples of genetic sequence data um, and, uh, and to impose ob obligations on those sorts of considerations. But we can't have that if, we, if we're not also looking at the equitable access to global goods and benefit sharing. So I'm going to take just one second to go through um, some examples of how that distributional justice issue uh, starts to make itself known in these provisions. So equitable access to global goods must be a core priority of, of this treaty. And how could it do it? Well, the first is through limitations on things like export controls or the use of advanced purchase agreements, perhaps even embedding a distribution mechanism, a COVAX plus kind of mechanism within the treaty. If we're looking at reducing inequalities and injustice, we can actually embed binding non-discrimination obligations. For those that have worked in international human rights law, um, this is a common, uh, common uh, element that you see in those treaties and is an incredibly powerful um, way of uh, embedding non-discrimination or even uh, distributional justice through adaptive governance. Um, as you know, one very simple way that has been uh, spoken about quite a lot with the pandemic treaty to date is equitable representation, geographic, um, on gender basis, but having that equitable representation in the pandemic treaty going forward. But I believe that we shouldn't be embedding not only distributional justice, but we actually have an opportunity with the pandemic treaty to be looking at reparative justice. So for each of these elements, what that looks like, for example, is financing and facilitating the independent research development and manufacturing capacity in, in LMICs so that we're not having to rely on prohibitions against export controls or trying to prevent the use of advanced purchase agreements. We're actually giving self-determination, not giving, that we're recognising the self-determination uh, in the pandemic treaty itself. And that requires common but differentiated responsibilities. So high income countries actually engaging in reparative justice through financing, technology transfer and capacity building. And for adaptive governance, what that could look like is we've seen the failures in the World Trade Organization. We've seen failures in other forums where high income countries have a disproportionate voice. 
Um, global health law forums are more democratic. We have 194 WHO member states, and we've really underutilized global health as a forum for lawmaking. And the pandemic treaty is an opportunity to use that democratic voice to put the needs and, and the perspectives of the global south front and center um, with a, in a manner of reparative justice. So this is part of a broader project that we're working on at pandemictreaty.net, our pandemic treaty project. And um, we have a number of publications on that website and I encourage you to go explore and of course, happy to discuss more um, as, uh, as the talk goes on today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. That was a brilliant uh, distillation uh, of, uh, of what I think is a very complex set of issues. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over now to uh, Calvin Ho. Calvin, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, wonderful to, to uh, join this forum. So first of all, uh, thanks so much, Ross, for the very kind um, introduction. And also a lot of thanks to uh, Kevin Charles from Oxford uh, ETOC Centre, um, and also to uh, Catherine Liffler from the World Health Organization for the opportunity to be involved in this very important conversation. Um, I haven't got any slides, but um, hopefully I'll be clear enough in terms of um, speaking to some aspects that Alex has already very helpfully highlighted. Uh, in particular, I'd like to mention that uh, whereas Alex has spoken on uh, the distributional aspects of justice, I'd like to pick up on the capabilities uh, aspect, uh, particularly in terms of how um, WHO member states and of course following from their communities as well as individuals are or perhaps are not capacitated to respond to an outbreak. So um, in, in, in this um, short presentation, I'd like to focus in particular on digital capabilities. So how well are member states communities and individuals, how well are they prepared to draw on digital technology to capacitate themselves in responding to the challenges of an outbreak? Um, so when we think about uh, digital capabilities, uh, there, there's very little mention of it. Of course, to start with, we uh, and, and to follow from what Alex has mentioned as you know, the broad international law landscape, uh, that there isn't a lot of international law instruments on health or global health for that matter. Of course, the, the key global health instrument would be the international health regulations. Of course, we know that this is uh, quite uh, an, an old document that has uh, developed over time. Uh, uh, and it, of course, that's some very important uh, norms as well as mechanisms uh, responding to an outbreak and essentially to facilitate collective action. So of course the international health regulations uh, originally started out as the international sanitary regulations and, and that would have been from 1951. Uh, there hasn't been many changes to this particular treaty. We see one key change that occurred in 1961. So that's when the international sanitary regulations became known as the international health regulations. And then, of course, the, the most recent major change would have followed from the SARS outbreak. Uh, so that would have led to our current version of the International Health Regulations, uh, which would be, of course, the 2000, uh, 2005 version. Of course, um, it, we see that there have been some important changes uh, in terms of uh, international mechanisms and more broadly the norms in this space. So you'd see a shift in focus from specific disease, uh, diseases to a broad all hazards kind of approach. So that's one of the key changes that we see being introduced into the IHR uh, in, uh, in, in, in the current 2005 version. There are also a number of important changes. Of course, you'd see a shift uh, to risk assessment in terms of the approach, as well as event-based surveillance. Uh, and uh, there's been, a quite considerable emphasis in the 2005 version of the IHR on uh, state-based uh, re reporting of uh, information from and, and drawing of information from all sources, 
uh, so sorry, actually, I backtrack a bit. So it's it's a gathering of of all kinds of different information in terms of uh, risk assessment, rather than just simply relying on what information the states uh, member states themselves would provide. So this would be an important change. And uh, in the IHR, of course, um, there's also quite a lot of emphasis on uh, member states developing core capacity. Uh, that would be required to prepare as well as to respond to health emergencies. I, I mentioned these changes because they speak to some of the goals, but I would argue not enough in terms of uh, the norms, the values that would underlie these particular objectives and means of achieving them. And of course, uh, there hasn't been much, if not any, mentioned uh, of uh, digital health capabilities. Uh, of course, to be fair, uh, these would be relatively more recent developments. So, of course, what we find today is that looking at the IHR, and uh, uh, many scholars have highlighted one of the key concerns here, which would be the um, well, very highly medical and technical ethos that, that underscore not just the IHR, but more broadly the work of the, the World Health Organization, which, of course, uh, is and remains the key global health organization uh, today uh, in the international law context. So, uh, of course, the criticism of that is that uh, there may well be a regulatory capture by medical, scientific, and technical uh, communities and expertise. So, um, of course, these are important without dispute, but then there isn't enough emphasis or consideration in terms of the sort of values that should underscore the work and the sort of values that should drive collective action. Um, in fact, not just drive collective action, but to enable collective action in bringing people together. So we do see this, um, I would think, in, in some of the challenges that have emerged uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, there hasn't been um, very strong uh, involvement in, in an equitable manner across different member states and, and certainly not across uh, communities as, as we see around the world. So uh, in response to a number of these challenges, uh, and, and also going back to one of the points that I'd like to highlight, of course, in terms of the digital capabilities, uh, I, I think that it could well be helpful to have um, a, a framework to guide action. Because when we think about framework, uh, there, there has been one framework in particular that I think has been uh, rather successful, and, and that would be, of course, the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, because that particular framework came about uh, through WHO exercising its uh, Article 19 power under its constitution. Of course, this speaks to the power of the WHO to make treaties. So I think this would be one avenue, of course, if uh, we do not intend to go with that particular route, then there are uh, at least to our other avenues. Of course, we have the Article 21 power to make regulations, of course, by WHO, or otherwise Article 23 in terms of the power of the WHO to make recommendations. But whether we're talking about the Article 19 treaty making power or some of the other powers relating to um, regulations or norm setting, uh, we, we must recognize and accept that the WHO has no enforcement power. So, um, so, the, 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 um, so quite unlike, say, for example, the UN Security Council, uh, it, it, it cannot compel action. So I think this highlights the great need, therefore, to have buy-in. So what is it that we can get buy-in from member states, uh, and more importantly, from communities and, uh, and individuals? And, and this is extremely important when we think about uh, digital capabilities. So of course, when we think about digital capabilities, it's, it's not something that's new. So if we think back uh, in pre-COVID days, uh, we do have, in 2018, the adoption of the digital health resolution by uh, member states of the World Health Organization. And uh, when we think about what the res resolution itself speaks to, there are a number of enablers of digital health future readiness. So they speak to, for example, the need to embed health and well-being in all digital policies. So digital health policies, of course, one need to question whether a particular member state uh, even have such a policy in place. Um, inclusiveness is important, prioritizing all people in designs. Um, and um, 
sustainability and resilience uh, points that Alex have already highlighted. So you see that when we think about uh, digital capabilities and uh, moving the digital health agenda forward, we need to consider all of these developments. And if we currently look at how prepared, how developed digital capabilities of member states are, uh, firstly, there isn't a whole lot of information. So if you look at the Global Digital Health Index, uh, it only reflects a very small handful of member states that have done a digital health assessment. Uh, but then, of course, you'd find uh, more broadly uh, the higher resource um, member states that are able to or have been able to deploy these technologies. But of course, even within these member states, we find um, different forms of uh, digital exclusion and, uh, and of course, different expressions of the digital divide. Uh, that in turn raises a number of social justice concerns because of course, what we find in these settings will be an exacerbation of the sort of inequities that we already find in these health systems. So I, I do think that uh, this is the right time to think about having a framework in place to guide developments uh, and, and also to track developments across all the various member states. We need to recognize that when we think about digital technologies, uh, there are a broad range of actors. In response to this particular pandemic, uh, we see the very important role that private organizations are playing. So these are non-governmental organizations. These could even be commercial entities. We need to think about um, how to involve them in appropriate ways. How do we think about governance in this particular space with many different uh, actors and quite different from the Westphalian emphasis that's embedded within the IHR as we find it today. Uh, importantly, um, I think it may be fair to say that there, there is uh, no particular mechanisms that could help us animate values. And I think that there are some very important values that have already been articulated by the World Health Organization. And, and um, I'd like to emphasize in particular, the values that have been set up by the WHO in its health for all approach. So, so what are the values underscoring the health for all uh, approach? We have democracy, we have equity, we have solidarity, we have inclusion, and we have human rights. Of course, important to re respect human rights, human rights in terms of accountability in terms of equality and non-discrimination, and of course, uh, also in terms of participation. So all of these values, again, they're not uh, self-enabling. Uh, so we do need to have mechanisms to support them. And we need to track closely capabilities, ultimately in terms of uh, the betterment of individuals, enabling them with the opportunity to live the sort of life that they would find worthwhile. So, so let me just put these points out there and I'd be very happy to uh, hear your comments on this. So thanks very much, Inspector. Thank you, Calvin. Uh, uh, over to you, Moga. Oh, you're muted. Thank you very much and uh, for introduction and um, really interesting um, intervention so far. So I am um, basically I would like to make two general comments and then some specific ones on access to um, so-called countermeasures in in an instrument treaty accord whatever it's going to uh, to be called the ethical values on on this. So I think the the the, the generally. Um, I think establishing the ethical values that we want to be included in the treaty, establishing these as human rights, with duty bearer, mainly government, having the responsibility to implement or to ensure that others implement this um, uh, agreement is, is critical. Um, for example, if there is, uh, if we talk about technology transfer, as Alex men me mentioned, um, then it's it's a commitment for governments to ensure not just themselves but also research institutions and pharmaceutical companies implement technology transfer. And I'll just say a, a thing or two later on about technology transfer. 
Secondly, um, again, as Cal Calvin said about um, WHO doesn't have um, teeth to implement, to um, ensure that things are, are implemented. But without that, without these commitments, um, there is a mechanism to watch um, that these commitments are implemented, then it, it just stays as a piece of paper. I disagree with you that the Security Council has power because as somebody from the Middle East, we know that it, it doesn't. Um, I think that the organization that has power and can push is the WTO, because if you don't implement whatever it is, trade sanctions is, is, is there, and of course trade is important. I'm not sure how we can do something similar with the treaty. Then come to some specific ethical considerations in, in the access to products, so medical products and medical te technologies. And Alex mentioned benefit sharing. I'll put that at the, at the beginning as the first, um, the first uh, issue. So it, it seems now that the, the, there is a division, almost geopolitical division, where the North, the West, whatever you want to call it, rich countries, high income countries, they want the sharing of the, the, the viral um, the material, the data, uh, everything about that, and that's it. While us in the South, what we're after is also this, but importantly, access to products that result from sharing this, this data. Otherwise, what are we benefiting if we share the data about the virus and not, and not share the products that result from this data? Two things to watch here, to, to worth mentioning here. One is that we kind of tend, to, I mean, I don't hear it very often in, in these debates about benefit sharing, that actually China, sequence the, the COVID-19 virus and shared it, shared the information on the internet on the 10th of January. So on the 31st of December, they said to WHO, hey, we have a problem. 10th of January, the, 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 the sequence was on the internet and that's what enabled at least Oxford University, but others as well, to start developing a vaccine and to start research on treatment. Um, the other thing to, to, to mention is the long debate on the benefit sharing for the uh, influenza um, um, uh, virus. And I remember the days when Indonesia stood really, really strong saying, okay, so we share the virus and, and then you sell us the, 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 the vaccine at very unaffordable price. I mean, it, it sounded really stupid. So they, negotiated really hard and ended up with the pandemic influenza preparedness, the PIP framework, um, where it's it's both are shared, the data and and then the 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 products are sold at kind of at an affordable price. It's this is a good example of implementing ethical values that enable innovation and access um, at the same time. Of course, it needs improvement for, for the I mean, this is old. We need something um, better now. The second point about um, uh, access to uh, countermeasures is um, fair allocation of medical products between countries. Let's not forget, at the beginning of a pandemic, there's always a shortage of supply. So you, you suppose that we there is an invention of a new vaccine or new medicine, they're not going to be enough for everybody. This is just fact of life. Um, and I, I remember in April 2020, I talked about this um, in my blog, and I just said that um, it seems that governments, um, particularly rich countries, have left three critical questions in the hand of pharmaceutical companies, which are supply, how much to produce, allocation, where to sell, and the price. And of course, naturally, pharmaceutical companies will sell for in high markets um, because they can get a high profit because they can sell at high price. And at the same time, this is matched with these rich countries wanting to um, um, vaccinate their citizens, which again, there's an ethical issue dilemma here because they do want to vaccinate their, their citizens and that's, that's um, understandable. So matching that, let's make profit. I want my, my, my people vaccinated. We've got the vaccine, hoarding the vaccines. And the result was that for most of 2021, for most of last year, um, Africa, where I do a bit of work, 
um, had basically hardly, it, the vaccines that they had were mainly from bilateral deals between their governments and uh, mainly Chinese companies. COVAX came late and came in drips and drabs. And uh, it was just like whenever there was anything available, COVAX relied totally, utterly on AstraZeneca and AstraZeneca relied totally, utterly on serum from India. And it's just the logic that one company provides for the whole world. Still, I really don't understand it. So, but meantime, um, the WHO earlier on, I think April or May 2020, I can't remember, um, developed this framework for fair allocation. And it did identify, here are the groups that are at risk. And the idea was, I mean, you remember, all of us remember, health workers were number one. The idea was health workers across all countries in the whole, uh, the whole planet. And then um, older people and then, you know, they had a particular system of, of prioritizing. What happened was the countries used that to prioritize within their own country rather than between countries. So hoarding continued. So um, so in the, the treaty is an opportunity and I see it as a big opportunity. Let's call it treaty. I don't know what they're going to call it, convention, I've called. So the treaty is a good opportunity to, uh, to insert certain commitment, recognizing the reality. So the reality is there is shortage of supply. So the issue is how to increase supply early so that if let's say health workers are the priorities, health workers all over the place don't fight, do I vaccinate? And I was asked that question so many times in the media. Do you vaccinate um, a nurse in the UK or in Birmingham or a nurse in Malawi? No, we shouldn't have that, that, that um, ethical dilemma because there should be enough supply for both nurses. And to have enough supplies, we come to the technology transfer and transparency and sharing knowledge, which of course um, is not happening. It hasn't happened uh, until now. Um, and 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 that it can happen because governments, if you think about what happened, the US, the UK, all the rich countries, they went and did this huge advanced purchasing with no conditionality. Even the system that was developed to um, um, invest in innovation and in access, basically CEPI, um, did not put conditionalities when it, it it funded um, some of the of the research for vaccines. So no conditionality, nothing about sharing technology, nothing about allocation, nothing about anything. So everything went to the north. You know, it was clear. So that needs to be this conditionality on technology transfer and fair allocation and fair price should be embedded in it. In it. Um, another fair allocation within countries. So there are groups, at-risk groups, um, once they identified, and I'd always say this example. So if we say health workers are a priority, I have to apologize, I've got a baby upstairs. So if you hear him, I'm sorry. Um, if you prioritize health workers and say, right, a hospital, we're going to vaccinate people in the hospital, but you don't have enough vaccine. So are you going to vaccinate the manager of the hospital who is normally a doctor, but sitting in his office, or the cleaner of the hospital who is cleaning patients' rooms. So there is between people in, inside countries, prioritization using human rights framework, like, you know, and other people like migrants, and, and that has been an issue with, with COVID, um, migrants, prisoners, you know, uh, people in remote areas, some kind of ethnic minorities, um, that's a national responsibility to ensure that these people that like if you say all people then all people from these groups also get get the vaccine then we go 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 back to the access issue um and again alex in in, in um mentioned investment in r d this is really really I, I can't say how critical that is um because it, what's happening now is that the, the 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 interest and the focus is let's develop a vaccine in 100 days. So who will develop it in 100 days? If you look around the world for capacity, who will develop it in 100 days? And therefore, who will control it and control again supply allocation and price? So it's it's not about you know I don't see debate about how to uh, ensure 
that there is a research capacity in developing countries and how to get um, manufacturing capacity in developing countries, how to encourage collaborative research. And I'm not saying that only the, the that, um, you know, I expect the US or NIH or the Wellcome Trust or whatever to invest in developing countries on their own. Absolutely not. I think our governments should prioritize medical research. If they prioritize it, and I should prioritize the health system, by the way, if they prioritize it, then they can ask others to help. But at the moment, medical research, sadly, is not a priority, as I, as I see it in many countries. In some countries, it is. And you could look at um, examples of South Africa, um, Rwanda now has started to invest and, and some other countries. So that's really, really critical. What the, the, what the North can do is um, fund collaborative research. That is really a big thing. And uh, as I said earlier, uh, put some conditionality about technology transfer. Um, my fifth point about it is, again, it, it was mentioned before, is outbreak or pandemic. So in preventing pandemic, we're dealing with outbreaks. You see, my worry is that the ethical issue that I see here is that if we just, if the world sees the treaty as um, dealing with outbreaks just to basically dump it and keep it inside, it might not, it might result in measures that don't deal with out, the outbreak, that don't benefit the people who are facing out, the outbreak. And, um, you know, it, it's just incredible that uh, monkeypox has been around in Africa since 1970. And um, it's only now that suddenly we realize, oh my God, we don't have enough vaccines because um, um, we only have smallpox vaccines. And, and, and again, this is exactly the same thing like COVID. Uh, rich countries are going around hoarding all the vaccines that are available for monkey, for, um, for, that can work for monkeypox, even not developed for it. And, but it has been in Africa for decades now. 50 years and no R&D there, no interest in it, in helping these outbreaks, you know, except to help them to not to spill over. And that's, we had that with Ebola as well. So I think um, a, a, a question for the pandemic treaty, whether they put that in prevention or preparedness, I'm not sure, but, or in both, um, is investing in dealing with outbreak to benefit people who are in, in, in these countries. Finally, I see, uh, you know, I, I talked about uh, uh, research and, and, uh, and development. I personally see two big elephants in this uh, treaty room. One is R&D and the other one is resilient health system. Thanks Alex for mentioning it. These both are national responsibility. They do require national leadership. Now, what the international community can do is a number of things. One, to help with like technology transfer. Two, to um, prevent the international law from putting barriers against these governments doing the right thing. Like what we saw a few weeks ago in the WTO with intellectual property rights and what we see about the push for privatizing healthcare rather than building public healthcare that can benefit everybody. Um, and the other thing is, um, ensuring transparency and accountability for all or every um, stakeholder. And I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you, Mocha. What a great set of uh, opening comments. Well, I must say the uh, question and answer is uh, lighting up and I invite uh, attendees uh, to actually look at those questions and maybe vote to make it easier for the, you can upvote questions. You may have similar questions yourself to ones that have already been posited. Uh, so when we turn to the uh, questions from the participants uh, that uh, we can go for the ones that have the most interest. I also invite uh, uh, people to tweet out uh, about what they're hearing uh, to sort of spread the word on the epidemic ethics webinars. So a lot of issues raised and a, a huge amount of work to, to be done and uh, clear interest in this. So I just want to sort of drill into, so nominally we're focusing on ethics and, uh, uh, um, and an ethics component uh, in this treaty. 
And we've had a kind of a little bit of uh, uh, pointers in the direction of what that might look like. I think Alex, you said in the preamble and uh, 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 Calvin and, uh, and Moga both pointed out uh, different values that, uh, that could be embedded within it. Uh, but what's the uh, magic for actually getting this uh, work done? Uh, how do we actually uh, get these ethically, ethical considerations explicitly recognized as ethical per se? Uh, and um, maybe I'll go to you first, Alex, to see what your thoughts are on that matter. Um, so, so there's the the practical side, right? The practical side is that um, for ethicists and, and groups like this to be uh, submitting to the IMB's process, um, and so there will be another round of public uh, comment in September. So there's opportunities for written submissions, and I think really elevating um, language around ethics and, and ethical principles um, and and how ethics can play in certain provisions of the treaty. I think is the the practical way of actually translating that. Um, I think. Uh, second to that practical is actually crafting language, um, language that member states can then say, hey, yes, we agree with that. We're going to fight for this to be included in the treaty, whether that be as, you know, as something as light as preambular or principles language or within the actual, um, within the provisions themselves. Um, so I think that's the, the practical approach um, to how it actually gets translated into, into the treaty and how you can actually get that in there. Great, thanks. Uh, Calvin, any thoughts? Yeah, thanks very much, Ross. Um, just to pick up on what Alex has mentioned, um, I, I, I think there is the need to think hard about how to draw broad participation. Uh, then there, there needs to be a clear indication of um, what are some of the very critical challenges that we've been confronted with. I think these many people should not find um, foreign, but I think what's really important is to highlight why it matters. So I'm not sure that uh, that well, when we think about individuals, uh, whether that's very well appreciated. So uh, why why is it important for us to have this conversation? Why is it important for every individual to be involved? And um, I, I tend to think rightly or wrongly that that ethics is still quite a foreign notion to say, for example, the woman and the man in the street. So, uh, so they need to appreciate why exactly does um, ethical uh, or an ethical concern matter? And for that matter, how would it affect them ultimately? So, um, so these are, I think, some of the more important points. The, the more formalistic kind of requirements, I think we have it there, and, and that's relatively clear. But, um, but my, my bigger concern is how such developments could in fact be people-centered, how exactly it could help to resolve some of the very um, intransigent kind of social justice concerns that we find in just about every society, whether rich or poor. So, um, th so that's uh, some comments I have to make right now. Thanks, Ross, over for that. Great. Thanks, Calvin. Uh, Moga, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, um, just a, a couple of things. I mean, obviously, I agree um, with with Alex and, and Calvin. Um, so, it, just the importance, just to emphasize the importance of talking to governments and working with governments. That this is a member state led um, process, and unless member states push things, it's difficult to to get them in. So that's really important. Um, and there is a regional consultation starting in August. So I think that's uh, also a really good opportunity for civil society, for others to, to engage. I really like what you said, Alex, that the importance of having language, but also the importance of simplifying language. So not everybody knows what we talk about when you say ethical consideration or ethical values or ethical issues in, to be included. What do you actually mean? So I think we need also to simplify things and share it as wide as possible with the outside world. So, so that when the, you know there is a little bit of pressure on the government to consider these issues. And again, kind of working on in the South, I, I see that as absolutely top priority. Great, thanks. This is a really uh, helpful set of answers. We need to make the case of why ethics matters. Uh, we need to uh, craft language that helps people understand why it matters. We need to simplify it and target it to receptors. And we need to get engaged in the process of, in, 
of uh, submitting our thoughts and our concerns uh, and participating in the evolution of the debate around the treaty. Excellent, thank you. So next question comes up is, uh, so how should obligations to embed ethics? So we've kind of agreed that ethics is important. We want to get it in there. We want to get it embedded into the uh, into pandemic policies. Uh, but uh, how do we, so how do we, what are the mechanisms and steps uh, for embedding ethics in, into these policies uh, and responses? And how do we figure out whether they've been uh, uh, fulfilled and characterized and by whom? So we're going to target it this way, but I think it might also be worthwhile having a strategy to uh, go along with our uh, pitch for the importance and salience. So um, I'm going to start with Calvin this time. What, what are your thoughts on this matter? Hey, thanks very much, Ross. Um, I, I think it is helpful to have particular mechanisms in place. And, and here, um, uh, um, I, I draw inspiration from what we find uh, in terms of the governance of research that we see today. So there you see over time and a relatively long uh, history of development. Uh, of course, it's got lots of um, terrible things being done to people in the name of research. But, uh, but over time, we see the development of review mechanisms. Well, they're not perfect, at least there is this mechanism there to work with researchers in thinking about how to, for example, um, involve communities, how to uh, enact or enable or animate for that matter, ethical values that are important. Uh, on the one hand, in terms of protecting the well-being of research participants, and of course, on the other, uh, enabling good science to develop. We haven't got as clear a mechanism, for example, in terms of working with, uh, say, public health data and uh, the use of such data in, say, digi digital applications that may be then used for public health uh, purposes or goals. So um, I think it would be helpful to think of how we could develop these mechanisms to be as inclusive as possible uh, but thinking back again about research governance, we started out with essentially research institutions, researchers, uh, subsequently, of course, you've got publishers, you've got sponsors coming on, uh, and then, of course, um, uh, international organizations of various uh, forms and sorts, including the WHO, uh, working with interested stakeholders in developing capabilities. So, so I think that's one possible uh, route that we could consider, and it may find uh, relevance in thinking about how best we could draw in the ethics in a meaningful way uh, and in the context of global, for that matter, public health. Thanks very much, Ross. Over. Thanks. Uh, Moga, do you have any additions you'd like to make on the points? Um, yeah, again, um... Yes, we don't have really, really a uh, good mechanism. I mean, there, there is a number of, of, of ways of evaluating, like, you know, the IHR, for example, they have a review every so often. I think what's so important in this one is, in, in my mind, two things. One is to have independent review process and really independent. And as you said, protect uh, whoever the reviewers independence. That is really critical. Um, the other thing is to collect the data on to, to review what's implemented and what isn't, um, it should be the data should be collected from various sources. So not just governments, but also civil society and communities and others to to, to find out um, how things are. Um, but that would raise the question: Is who's going to fund that? You know, independent review means people collecting data and 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 all that so you don't you don't need the funding and that's a question and I, I have no idea where the funding is going to come from and the current funding that has been announced by the world bank this fifth um it doesn't give any um assurance that things will will be good it's still kind of the old colonized um aid Thanks. Uh, Alex, anything you'd like to add to this? 
Yeah, so I think there are um, three different angles by which we can embed obligations in the treaty that reflect ethical considerations or priorities. And I think the first one is um, directly restricting or limiting um, or prohibiting certain behaviour or conduct by states um, or facilitating certain behaviour and conduct by states. For example, um, the notifications and the sharing of information, um, the uh, you know prohibitions or, or limitations on the use of export restrictions during a declared public health emergency or a pandemic. And so there's that direct obligations where we can think about what would be the unethical conduct or the ethical conduct that we wish to regulate. Then the second way um, is through human rights. Now that's when we're dealing with the national system largely, what is the state's obligation to its citizens and things like the right to health um, AAAQ framework, um, you know, accessibility, availability, acceptability, quality, healthcare, countermeasures, services. Um, and so using human rights frameworks within the obligations themselves for establishing what is conduct. Now, that then might reveal to us some more ethical considerations when, say, human rights does not necessarily reflect a public health approach. Uh, and so, so considering how that, that may be weighed. And the final area where we can see obligations being embedded is through this catch-all term equity that is being used. And I think this is the opportunity that um, global health ethicists and public health ethicists should really perhaps look at. How can we define equity? What do we mean by equity? For me, I, I define as being more than distributive justice between countries, but a form of reparative justice and reparations. And I agree. I think um, uh, Matthew uh, made a, a question in the comments about, you know, that may not be palatable to high-income countries. Um, there are ways that we can embed um, uh, that sort of reparative justice um, through an ethical lens that, that may not be using that language, although I tend to like the normative impact of using that language myself. So there are three ways that I think we can actually aim to actually embed ethics into the treaty obligations themselves. Thank you. Well, so that was another exceptionally lucid set of responses. And we may even, you know, tip towards a certain prioritarian view when we're looking at, you know, that to sort of uh, uh, complement uh, uh, reparative justice approaches. Um, so in the two and a half years that I've been uh, moderating webinars, I have never seen so many questions come up, uh, both online and in the chat. So uh, we may need to have a volume two of this. And I'm a little bit... Uh, 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 because obviously this is something that's topical. Um, so one of the questions uh, that's been, so I'm just gonna sort of uh, use a little bit of um, combining of different uh, types of questions. So this uh, treaty is going to have to fit in with the international health regulations, obviously. And um, what is the, you know, is the IHR 2005 still fit for purpose? Is there a way of doing the job that a pandemic treaty might want to do within a, uh, the IHR. And just a, an, an additional comment to that, are there any harms associated with a huge focus on a, a pandemic treaty that might obscure or overlook other critically important uh, uh, health issues that need uh, attention? So those kind of, uh, because we've got mechanisms in place, we're creating a whole new mechanism that's gonna bring a lot of resources. Um, and I'm gonna start with you, Mulga. Do you wanna chew on that one for a second? Uh, yeah, so yeah, clearly there is an, an, an updating of the eye chart that there's, can you hear me? I'm getting funny message. Yeah, okay. So there is clearly a, an, a, a process of updating the IHR and I, actually last week in the treaty discussions, um, there was quite quite a number of countries talked about that this, this the discussion about the treaty should not mask or uh, undermine, they use different languages to say, basically, these should be uh, complementary processes. The, the advantage of the IHR that is already a legal obligation, or it imposes legal obligation on countries, it's already approved, um, it already has quite a lot of good things that um, um, if really implemented, we wouldn't have been where, where we have been. Um, so implementation is, is one of the problems with IHR, which could be a problem here as well, or for any international treaty. Anyway, um, but, but the COVID particularly has shown there is some gaps in the IHR, and I think that's what the treaty is, is um, um, 
you know, complementing by focusing on these gaps, but also, you know, life changed and things move. And, you know, it's not just the virus that develop, you know, our thinking develop. So like the focus on equity, as you absolutely rightly said, Alex, um, that's really important to, to, to bring into the treaty. It's not that much uh, of it in, in the IHR, the, 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 the whole issue about access and innovation and access is not a big issue on IHR. Um, so, you know, it's the, the, the complementarity is possible. And I don't think we should say, let's dump that one and go for this one. I think that we have something, it's working, but it's lacking a lot of things. Let's focus on the, on these things. Um, the other thing that that you raised a, a really, really critical question about the focus on treaty or in, in pandemics will, will drag from other, other um, health issues that is already happening with COVID. You know, already the, the vaccination rate for kids came down, the uh, access to HIV treatment came down, TB came down, all that with a pandemic. But to be honest, the problem is not, I mean, it is that, but it's also that we have, or politicians have very, very short memory. So I don't think, I think there will be quite a lot of fuss about the pandemic treaty. Um, and then, uh, you know, we're already saying COVID is not an issue here. And if there's no COVID and no monkeypox and nothing else new, new comes, um, they, they won't do that. that, that they won't have that focus. The problem is that doesn't mean they will go back to focus on the other diseases because at least in the North, as you know, aid is coming down. So there's not that much interest and um, low income, low and middle income countries should really, I think there is a recognition now that focusing on health in general, um, including manufacturing capacity and health system is a national security issue. So hopefully, they will be the buildup for other diseases and for the pandemics at the same time will happen um, and prioritize in the South. That's my hope. And we see Great. some signs of that for in Africa, particularly. Great, thanks. Uh, Kelvin, your thoughts. Well, thanks very much, Ross. I agree with uh, Moga and Alex in terms of the need to think very hard about uh, equity and how we are to address some of the social injustices that we see uh, with us. But I, I think that if we are to have a treaty, it may be helpful to think about how to introduce a, a sort of institution that could support deeper reflection on developments. So as we see the IHR, uh, and of course, uh, the very important work undertaken by WHO and related entities, they remain, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and other scholars have noted, is very technical in nature. So it involves collecting information, uh, providing uh, means of uh, technical evaluation. Of course, these are all very important, but then uh, there, there isn't that sort of institutional framework that could support ethical evaluation, very critical thinking, and how to draw in voices. Of course, we keep mentioning participation in the human rights framework. We talk about inclusivity in ethics, but then how that is actually going to happen, we don't know. Otherwise, we tend to uh, be prone to uh, reenact the sort of biases that we see today. We, we tend to see the injustices being perpetuated. So, so, um, so I think that is something that we, we might be helpful to think about, especially in the uh, international law and ethics kind of framework or field, uh, whether there is actually a means for much deeper participation moving beyond, uh, well, e essentially uh, developing technical capabilities while important, but, uh, but not quite addressing some of the very deeper problems that we see today. So thanks very much, Ross, over. Um, Alex, your thoughts? So I am. Um, I, I have to confess that the IHR were my first international law love, and unfortunately, I've I have fallen out of love with them. And I think part of the rationale for that is, is that they have a deeply colonial history. We go back well before the 1950s to the International Sanitary Conventions, when the the beginnings of these notification alerts really began in the mid 19th century, and it was all about protecting Europe from the other. 
And unfortunately, that message is still part of the IHR and core to the way it operates and it focuses on notifications and the assumption that as long as countries get told in time, they will be able to, and countries being high income countries, they'll be able to mount a public health response. There's nothing there about capacity building that is being translated into action. Article 44 has sat stagnant. They um, do not have conferences of parties to come together to rethink how the IHR could be, could be updated and, and revised. There's nothing really in there about response or recovery. And so I think the IHR have an important part to play in a very narrow set um, and perhaps as perhaps referenced by the pandemic treaty for that, that early alert. But there's, there's a lot of scope for reform there as we have definitely seen in how the public health emergency of international concern for monkeypox has played out and the, you know, what I believe legal misinterpretation of criteria early on. So how does the pandemic treaty not fall into the same issues? I think one of the big steps is firstly, it can't be a colonial interest instrument. It cannot be representative only of, of, of global health securitized approaches to protecting high income countries or countries that already have strong, strong health systems that have clearly not uh, managed to have not lived up to their expectations. I think the second thing is building in that, um, that point that uh, Murga mentioned about uh, political memories being so short we have to build in things like conferences of parties to build those norms, to build that trust and to directly target and address the fact that we have governments coming in every three to five years and switching and changing and forgetting the obligations that they've, they've agreed to in previous uh, administrations. So I think governance is going to be so critical how the treaty is negotiated and then how the treaty operates and is implemented um, really has to be accountable and transparent, participatory, equitably, and it has to follow the rule of law. Um, and that it's the bare minimum for us not falling into the same pitfalls that the IHR um, have had and, and do need to still be addressed. And any thoughts about any potential downside of all the focus on the pandemic uh, in this treaty? Yeah, I, I think um, I think there's a real risk that we lose the opportunity to build something as, as critical as universal health coverage. I think that, you know, we can look at where the health co-benefits are for beyond pandemics and really think of this as a chance to, excuse me, <clears throat> invest there. Um, and I think I think that there is a real downside, there's a real risk that we're going to continue to focus on spillover and these upstream um, issues once again uh, and forget that this is an opportunity to build global health more broadly um, and to make law that prioritises global health, not the preferences of, say, pharmaceutical companies or of, of high-income countries. Thank you. So I'm going to combine two questions that kind of highlight tensions uh, that need to be navigated uh, uh, in this treaty and for the panelists' thoughts on this. So the first tension is about how much uh, local capacity uh, or national you know, capacity will be preserved uh, to respond uh, to pandemic threats. And then a very interesting sort of parallel tension between uh, the interests of animal health and well-being uh, by the inclusion of, in your, in your model of the treaty, that I'm not sure it's there yet, but One Health, I, but even though I completely agree with you, it should be there, uh, but between uh, animal and, and uh, human health. Um, so I'm going to reverse the order again, and so maybe this time I'll start with you, Alex, uh, and then I'll go to Calvin and Moga. So I think, um, you know, our, I think One Health is and perhaps an opportunity to build those local capacities. Um, I think uh, there is a lot of um, vagueness around what does One Health actually mean? What do we mean when we talk about it in treaty? I think there's a real risk that we will over-focus on, on One Health. So we need to think about how we actually operationalise um, uh, operationalize local to the national and uh, that intersection between animal health and One Health. One example um, is, for example, in the notifications process, and we recently published a piece in The Lancet on this, um, is, you know, right now there isn't a incentive or channels or processes to be sharing information about what is happening within, say, animal health or at the local level when there are small-scale outbreaks um, and that they go into the academic publication process uh, and don't really inform public health or outbreak response. And so there's systems about thinking, there's systems ways of thinking about how information is shared that perhaps um, something like the pandemic treaty or reform to the IHR can can start to approach again it's we go into a lot of detail in this, this paper that we have in the Lancet that I'll, I'll drop in the chat in a moment but I think part of um, 
part of the challenge is for the treaty is to, to for us not to use necessary high level general statements that we don't follow up with some form of guidance, whether they be non binding guidance or other technical instruments that then actually say, well, what do we mean by One Health? What do we mean by local capacity? Uh, what do we mean when we do the evaluations process for these local capacities? We need to really have that degree of specificity, even if they're not contained in the treaty itself. So that's where the framework approach might give us some of that flexibility uh, to move beyond these sort of general statements and give us some detail. Great, thanks. Uh, Calvin? Um, thanks very much, Ross. So um, my colleagues and I have, have done a bit of work uh, in, in relation to uh, One Health and the data space. So um, we use the term One Digital Health to highlight some of the problems. Uh, so uh, again, the problems are not new, but we haven't got uh, uh, well clear solutions to them. Of course, these relate to uh, the lack of multilateralism and, and fragmentation. So if you if you were to think about the One Health space, for example, of course we have the IHR speaking to very specific sorts of health concerns. Although the risk assessment, as we've seen, is is rather broad. Um, but then when we move into animal health, uh, we do have, of course, the Convention on Biological Diversity speaking to uh, quite a lot of uh, non-human related uh, biological materials as well as related data. Uh, we haven't got a, a, a clear, uh, well, international law framework, unless you consider the perhaps Paris Convention uh, speaking to some of the earth science kind of matters. So, so you see, a huge fragmentation there. You've got different people collecting different sorts of information. Uh, and, and then, of course, getting them to share across all the different domains is one of the key challenges. Uh, and then you've got different interests as well. You've got private interests of states, for that matter. You've got the, the interests of private organizations. Uh, you've got industry involved. So, uh, so when we talk about having to get hold of this information and to, to uh, make good sense, of uh, such information, whether it's for predictive purposes or for planning purposes, uh, that, that's formidable, leaving aside uh, the a huge disparity in capabilities on the part of uh, governments, on the part of uh, entities in working with such data. Uh, and then of course, related to all of this would be all the information related concerns, concerns with how to make sense of information. How do we evaluate them? How do we safeguard against epistemic injustices? Uh, how do we address concerns of misinformation, disinformation that we see today? So, so all of these challenges, I think, uh, are, are what we see uh, in a very big way from this current pandemic. And I, I do think that there is a need uh, for the new treaty, if it should come about, to speak to these concerns because we did not, I would think, see them in a very big way during the SARS outbreak. So that uh, led to the current 2005 version. But moving forward, we must recognize that uh, there, there are very important changes in, in these sorts of domains that uh, will require collective action, that will require uh, a means of forging uh, multilateral action. Thanks very much, Ross. Thanks, Calvin. Moga. So I look at that from kind of two sides. One is my worry about taking One Health and uh, you know coordination, collaboration, whatever, as a global level thing, which means like you drag ministers of this and the other, and officials of this and and the other sector um, to Geneva or New York or whatever every now and again to talk about things and they go back home Monday morning, they back to their normal work. Um, so I, I do worry about that. On the other hand, I see huge opportunities to really link the local and national with animal and, and human health. If you, if you look at, at local level, you know, in a village where people rich and poor have animals, this is their asset. That is so important. I, I remember my mother had some um, um, friends who lived in a, in a village nearby, and I, it used to amaze me how they spend hours talking about the health of the water buffalo of the lady or the, the, the her um, sheep and her, I, I don't know, goats and stuff. And it's like so serious 
that the, 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 the animal is ill and so desperate that the lady was to get it treated. So, so I think working with local communities, I mean, obviously it would be slightly different if you talk about wild, um, you know, or animals in, in the wilderness as it were, although goodness knows, you know, humans are everywhere now, hardly anything wild, but actually working with local people, that's where you link, that's where you get the notification on both animal and human health. And it, it really is also worrying me that we talk surveillance, surveillance, as if it's something that happens uh, that kind of like, you know, let's big, build a big lab in the capital and then we have a global system of surveillance. I mean, obviously you do need that as well, but unless you have the community health workers who are sitting in a village or a neighborhood or, or whatever, talking to people, having the trust of people there and that trust partly by providing service that they need, which has nothing to do with pandemics. So they create that trust and therefore when there is some, and that person, that health workers has to be knowledgeable, has to have good training, good remuneration so that they can actually recognize, people can tell them what's happening and they can recognize things and then they can notify and send the information without that basic system, which can work for human and for animals to get together. I don't think we'll get good surveillance ever, no matter how much you spend on this global this and global that. I really think that it is time if we learned anything from Ebola starting with and from uh, and HIV before that, and, uh, and COVID, it is about shifting the power from so-called global to the local and then going up. And, you know, it's a, it's a coordination. Thing. It's um, two ways where things meet. I'm not saying that we don't need global, of course we do, but it's about investing in both and both meet. But to just go global only, we're not going to get anywhere. And to go local only, also we're not going to get anywhere. Thanks, Margaret. So this, uh, we're, we're getting close to time and we're clearly not going to get to um, all of the questions. So I'm gonna to try to bundle up into an almost, you know, black hole density, uh, one question that draws together a few of the threads. So, so there's been a lot of comments in both the chat and in the question and answer about the clearly uh, obvious uh, inequalities and heterogeneity between uh, different member states as this is going to come through the WHO, it'll be a member state type uh, 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 event and, and how we get and I think those of us who study and are interested in the IHR have quite clearly seen how uh, different member states have uh, uh, variably uh, upheld their their uh, uh, commitments to the IHR. So it's really nice to have a, a new treaty that may impose even more uh, uh, requirements uh, on nation on member states. Um, and how would and then the questions of evaluation? How would we know if we've gone through it and it's not going to be an easy process to get a, a treaty like this off the ground? Um, and it's going to take resources and time. How will we know that we've created a successful treaty that's actually addressing the problems it's meant to solve? So I hope I've coherently drawn uh, uh, two uh, facets together. Uh, if not, I apologize. Uh, some days I'm not terribly long and coherent. So I'm gonna uh, start with Alex and work my way to, or actually, no, I did it. I'm gonna be unfair. I'll, I'll start with uh, Moga and work my way back to Alex. So Moga, then Calvin, then Alex. Okay, um, right, <laughs> very difficult. How do we know that the treaty is, is a good treaty and how would we reach that? Um, actually, what we see, um, the example, so the, the, the PIP, the pandemic um, influenza framework took a long time to negotiate, but we got it at the end. The tobacco was the same. Um, even reversing the guidelines, okay, it wasn't a treaty, but reversing the guidelines at WHO on treatment of Hypertension took a bit of time, but it was against big uh, powers. It it um, uh, it was reversed. You know, the international code on breastfeeding was absolutely. I mean, the, all most of you are young, you wouldn't remember that, but that was absolute hell at WHO, and it needed a really strong leader to to get us through that concept of essential medicine. It was the same. So that when what I learned through these things. And just recently, the trips waiver at the WTO is that when developing countries stick together, 
and realize their power. Because to be honest, and I come from a developing country and I work with, with developing countries, so I, it, it feels to me that sometimes they don't realize that they have power collectively, not this country and that country, collectively. Once they realize their power and stick to it. And you could see last week, they, there was quite a push from, I can't remember if I say EU or the US, about the, the concept of animal health. And Botswana said, hang on, we need to debate that and understand it. We can't just say agree without knowing what, what it involves, what it entails, what commitment will, will come to us. So I think that would um, ensure at least, and because it's a treaty, it's a negotiation. So I do understand that we can't get absolutely everything, but at least we can get the essential things. Um, on access to medicine, I, I, I don't know if we will get another um, waiver. Um, I mean, we do want a waiver on intellectual property in the treaty. Whether we get that or not, I don't know. But for everything else, I think we should get it if, if developing countries stick together. And if academics and civil society get together and manage to you know um, do what we already uh, colleagues talked about about the you know language and, and 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 you know making people understand why ethics are important and we campaign about that then at least we create the environment for governments to stick together and be strong thanks moga uh calvin well thanks very much ross um as always for the um wonderful ability to synthesize across all these uh, uh, <laughs> very vast domains. So, um, so um, I, I, I think uh, to pick up on a, a point that Alex actually mentioned in one of her comments, we do need much greater clarity in terms of um, say equity or equality. That there must first of all be some agreement in terms of what we're attempting to address. I would argue that if we look at the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, uh, it's very clear in terms of what the problem is uh, and the sort of targets that we're att attempting to achieve. So um, if the treaty is to be successful at all, then we need much greater clarity in terms of what we're hoping to achieve with that. So going back to perhaps more phil philosophical Dokinian kind of question, uh, so equality of what or equity of on, on, on what in relation to what, because it, it's across uh, so many different issues and so many different matters. So it can't be a situation of having to address all the problems in the world and end up ultimately not addressing anything at all. So, so that is a huge concern. And, and the other thing I think is that it's not as though uh, we are initiating this conversation ab initio. It's not something that we've never had. It's, we're, we're not working from a clean slate, if is essentially. So uh, we're clear about the SDGs. And I think that whatever treaty this is, it, it needs to continue to support the uh, agreements that we have in terms of the SDGs. And of course, equity we see is central to a lot of these initiatives. And where health is concerned, health for all, of course, and, and universal health coverage is essentially premised on equity. So if we think about uh, the One Health sort of issues and or, or, or One Health related issues and where the Convention on Biological Diversity is concerned, again, this is actively debated in the literature, but you know we do have the Nagoya Protocol. We do have some expression of what fair and equitable benefit sharing is like, uh, but of course, I and other colleagues have argued that that's not enough. We need to think about scaling up from there. We need to think harder about what exactly uh, fair and equitable uh, benefit sharing would mean, particularly from a capabilities kind of standpoint. And then, of course, if we bring in planetary health, justice is clearly a very important concern that's linked to sustainability and resilience, particularly in thinking beyond what would be our very conventional uh, anthropocentric kind of bias and approach. So, uh, so. So I, I think that we need to build on all these uh, conversations that we've had, draw on them, uh, and to use them as a means to forge uh, collective action in addressing very clear concerns and having very clear goals. It's not very helpful in my view to have a very broad kind of framework or treaty that speaks to so many different kinds of issues and ultimately not addressing anything in a very purposeful or purposive way. So my thoughts for now, thanks so much, Ken Ross. Thank you. Um, Alex, over to you. So I, I, um, I, I like a lot of the points um, that have been raised by my other, um, by my co-speakers. And I would say that a lot of um, 
a lot of these challenges we've actually dealt with in other realms of international law as well. And for, for mine, um, my other hat is as a climate lawyer. And um, I think there's a lot from international climate law that we can learn for the pandemic treaty around norm building, around principles, around structuring a framework convention. Um, I have a short piece in, in Nature about this, but I want to focus on one particular aspect of this, and that is if we are looking at different stand, like different levels across systems, we have two approaches, and I, I believe we need both. The first is minimum obligations, so minimum standards that everyone is held to, these common obligations um, that are important for pandemic uh, preparedness, response and recovery. There's also um, these common but differentiated obligations, taking a term that came up a little bit in the IMB, uh, it is a little bit controversial in the IMB setting, not in the international climate law setting where there's a recognition that there are different levels of resources um, and different levels of contributions to risk. Um, and in the common but differentiated responsibilities, I think the lesson that we can take here is about the role of high income countries in financing technology transfer, building those capabilities, particularly if, the, if there's going to be a continued push on the sort of securitization angle of, of global health security. Um, so I think taking those lessons from climate law, those minimum obligations as well as common and then but differentiated responsibilities is one way that we can start to build a normative framework that is ethical and equitable. Uh, thank you. So we are almost at time. And I, I do have one proposal. I think if uh, the world were smart, it would choose uh, Alex, Calvin and Moga to uh, lead the charge in creating the uh, uh, the pandemic treaty. Uh, I have learned an immense amount from you. I found your uh, responses to the questions uh, really succinct and illuminating. And, uh, and the combination of the three perspectives, I think, really uh, set some nice uh, guideposts down for uh, the ethics community to make a strong contribution here. So I'm going to just ask for any final last short comments anybody would like to make. And uh, I'll go back to Moga. Do you have any last comments from you? Just to thank you um, for this really use, very useful. I, mean, I learned a lot from um, Alex and Calvin. Thank you. And I would like to connect with you guys afterwards. Um, uh, and, and thanks to the audience for really interesting questions. And thank you for sharing and for putting the questions together so we can um, uh, you know, try to answer and and uh, input. I think that the, the key issue for me is, is what you said, we said that, that it's, is very, very essential that to take this opportunity and ensure that we insert clear ethical commitment, not values, commitment that governments have to make um, in this treaty, you know, take that example. So we avoid things like uh, the, the failure of it, well, the, the faults in the IHR and the failure in my mind of things like the Act A and COVAX. Great, thanks. Uh, Calvin. Thanks very much, Ross. So um, yeah, a, a note of thanks as well to everyone because it's been a great learning experience for, uh, from listening to co-speakers, cool uh, from the very instructive questions. Uh, so really helpful in helping me to think through some of the issues as well. Um, uh, well, hopefully this might point us to perhaps a, a second webinar of, on, on a similar kind of topic. I presume there'll be more, uh, but I, I do very much look forward to uh, continuing conversations. Thanks so much. And we come full circle. We began with Alex and we'll end with Alex. You get the uh, final word as well. Well, um, echoing the thanks to, to uh, co-speakers and, um, and Epidemic Ethics for this event, um, I would want to really encourage those in the audience and for ethicists to get involved in the public sessions um, and to keep an eye out on the WHO's IMB um, website for um, opportunities to put submissions written and, and oral submissions, um, because that's how uh, ethical considerations will help be brought into this. Um, in particular, think about draft language. I think that would be most helpful for member states. So. Great, thanks. We could be the Cerno de Bergerac, so to speak. <laughs> the thing. So, so uh, obviously, I, I apologize to all the participants whose questions we didn't get to. We'll see about perhaps having a follow-up session. Uh, I would really like to thank uh, Alex, Moga, and Calvin for being absolutely, you know, incisive and lucid and succinct 
uh, in summarizing incredibly difficult, complex issues and uh, bringing illuminating insights uh, to the debate and helping the bioethics community move this forward. And just a reminder to everybody attending that we will be posting this on the uh, Epidemic Ethics website uh, and on the uh, and the recording will come soon. And stay tuned uh, for uh, future events in this series. Uh, they're always exciting and informative. And please uh, tweet this out uh, so other people can uh, uh, share the uh, wisdom that we were uh, uh, so um, uh, privileged to receive today. So with that, I'm going to uh, bring us to a close. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. And I look, be well, and I look forward to seeing all of you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you for excellent sharing. Bye. <laughs>